You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. For hundreds of ideas, free experiments and more, go to physicseducation.com.au. And now, here's your host, Ben Newsom. Our next guest, Brett Solakis, is a man on a mission. He's a primary teacher of over 20 years' experience in Australia and Southeast Asia, but he also has been heavily involved in social media. I mean, really involved. Think Twitter, think Aussie Ed, and think thousands of teachers communicating on a weekly basis, and look, he's the founder of the whole thing. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. Yes, and welcome back to another Physics Ed podcast. My name is Ben Newsom, and this time we have a bit of a longer interview, but gee, it's worth our time. This time we're speaking with Brett Salakis. Some of you might know Brett from Twitter. You can catch him on Sunday nights at Australian Eastern Standard Time about 8 o'clock, where he heads up with a team of other educators, the Aussie Ed Twitter chat. And we're not talking like 5, 10, 15 people. There are some evenings when it gets to hundreds, if not thousands of people all over the world who are teaching, not just in classrooms, but in many different ways. I think you're going to get a lot out of this. So um, let's uh, cut the intro and let's just get right into it. You're listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. Why don't you book us for a science show or workshop in your school? We love seeing students get excited about science, and you will too. Go to physicseducation.com.au and click on Schools for more info. Brett Salakis, thanks very much for popping on the Physics Ed Podcast. Yeah, no, g'day. Great to be here. Uh, especially uh, considering it's a Saturday evening, the kids are in bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Never-ending never ending task, but that's yeah. okay. It is um, for people who don't uh, know us. We've, we've both got young kids, and so it's it's, it's um and and Brett's a, a flat out as a as a teacher, and um he's given up his Saturday evening, which uh, firstly yeah, hats off, even though I don't have a hat on right now. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. Do you know what? Uh, it, it, it's quite funny because in normal life, um, so busy, you know, just living your day day to day life and your day to day routine, and as you say, they're teaching. And teaching, you can be so time poor during during the teaching day and the, during the working day. And as you know, Ben, and, and perhaps some of the people listening in, um, I like to connect uh, online as, as much as I can. Probably a little bit addicted to it, but uh, uh, that's okay. That's my that's my advice. Oh, workaholics are uh, totally yeah. fine here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I actually find, particularly when you, you, you're talking to people all over the world, Australia being, you know, far-flung corner of the globe and um, obviously surrounded by a lot of ocean, there's, there's a significant um, time zone difference depending on uh, who you're talking to. And mm. usually if you're talking to someone, you know, off in Europe or off in um, South America, North America, something like that, talking in our evening actually makes it a lot easier for them. So do you know what? I've, I've, I've become used to talking sort of once the, the the stillness of the night has come about. And, you know, I find it actually suits my, my working habits uh, yeah. even better. So no, I totally agree. Um, uh, at my office, we've set up a swag. Well, for me, I've got a swag in my video conference room and I have definitely done back-to-back conferences to New York and it's, it's two a or three. swag. That's a, such an Aussie word, isn't it? Yeah, bedroll for those uninitiated. <laughs> Yeah. No, it sounds like, yeah, I brought up some swag, but what, you're swimming in gold? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Um, Do you lucky you have your tucker box down there or something? Oh, Jesus, Ozzy, <laughs> yes, now. <laughs> yeah, oh, gosh. No. Oh, Billy T by the side. I love Billy T. Actually, it makes a good tea bag rocket. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, dear, uh, we kind of were chatting offline before we got started. We were wondering whether we'd go down some tangents, and yes, we are. We are definitely going to go down some tangents. Uh, we can be Australian before we get into education, hey? Uh, why not? I reckon it's all good. No, I, I agree. Actually, to be honest, the time zones things aren't t- too bad. Um, West Coast US works quite nicely. Um, mm-hmm. And actually, to the UK, it's not too bad because it's almost, almost directly opposite. Yeah. Um, the eastern states of the US are very difficult um, to usually line up something that's nice, um, but usually better during the summer than it is in winter. Mm-hmm. Yes, very true. But anyway, look, uh, look, thanks very much for popping on. Like, um, uh, some people may not actually know what you do, Brett, so we probably should get into yeah, that's that. that's okay. So, so Brett, uh, who are you? What do you do? That sort of thing. Well, look, I'm, I'm a... I'm a primary school teacher, um, yep. first and foremost. You know, at the moment I'm teaching year six, so looking at 11 and 12-year-olds. I've 
taught in a range of different schools. This year I happened to actually be working at MLC at Burwood in Sydney, yep. and that's an all-girls school. So I'm, I'm working with uh, all girls and, and, and something I've never done before and I'm really, really enjoying it mm. uh, at the moment. So that's brilliant. Different classroom dynamic there, eh? Very, very different, but absolutely flying through the work. The girls are just – I've got a terrific – bunch of kids and and yeah, at, at the end of the day that that's really what counts so they're, they're loving learning and loving experimenting and and just loving um no fear uh, and just getting right into it so it's it, it's in a beautiful class to teach and just loving it there that's so been fantastic i mean i mean this is the thing as a primary teacher you've got okay you everyone love okay we clearly you being on this you love your science but um you've got history art maths music <laughs> everything else to fit in i mean how do you juggle all that Oh look, um, that's a massive question, isn't yeah, it? I, know. Uh, I suppose that? that's the that's the whole thing between being a, a generalist and a specialist. Mm. And I've actually started to come to understand and appreciate the the difference between perhaps having a whole middle school concept. I think when we when we bring children in, I really get that you need someone who is has that skill set for kindergarten and those younger years. But mm. I, I think when I was a boy, I, I left my, my primary school in year four, went off, and we, we had a couple of years. I went to an all-boys school, a couple of years. Where else? Um, I went to a Morris Brothers school. So the, okay. I, I went to a, a, a tr- normal, traditional, um, co-educational primary school and then went off and, and had a couple of years away from everybody yeah. <laughs> and then went in, in my senior school. Uh, to to another to another boys' school I, again mm. in Australia. We, we sort of moved away from that model where we were doing that bit of a change in, in year four, and, and we've very much come. I think virtually every school now is K to six, seven to twelve. Mm. If you actually think about it, the needs of a, a twelve-year-old kid in year six are light years away from the needs of a child who's five years old in kindergarten. Especially but at the start so of year. similar, yeah, exactly, especially at the start of year, but so similar to probably the needs of a 13-year-old in year seven. Yeah. And that year seven kid uh, is probably light years away from the needs of, of, of a, someone in their final years of study. So mm. uh, I think that we often talk about why do we have this change when children uh, roll over from primary school into high school. And, and I, I think it's almost time for us to have a little bit of a look at the way that we have uh, our education system because our specialists, our generalists, and that transition that a middle school sort of concept allows could minimise that sort of dip. And I'm very fortunate in the environment that I'm teaching at the moment. I am in that uh, middle years sort of program and I teach in an IB school so they have that whole yeah. uh, MYP, the middle, the middle years happening. So I think a big winner, I'm, I'm seeing people actually thriving because of it. So um, that's fantastic from, from what I'm actually doing at the moment. Look, you've been in schools for a long time. Um, have you dealt with um, the IB, the Inter- International Baccalaureate um, schools before? I've been fortunate enough. I've, this is my 20th, 20th year of teaching, uh, and I was lucky enough that in my 20s I spent a lot of years sort of travelling. I lived in Southeast Asia for a while, so I taught I was. Singapore is almost my home away from home. I, I feel like I've got a, a second home in Singapore, mm. um, but obviously very proud Australian. Yeah. Um, but uh, I was fortunate enough to have a, a bit of experience teaching in a few other schools, like just um, tinkering with Malaysia and Indonesia and things like that. But, you know, very much being based in, in Singapore and getting to see some of the international schools and how, how they operate there and even doing um, some work with some of the local schools. So, as a broad experience, I'm very fortunate in my early teaching years to be able to see not only what other systems were doing, but other cultures and other countries. And I suppose I've been fortunate enough then to cherry pick the best of what I saw, and and, and that sort of uh, made the lovely tapestry that is my my teaching style, a very East meets West teaching style. I think. No, that's cool. I mean, actually, what what even got you into it in the first place? Uh, well, do you know what? Um, that's a funny question. Very typical, real blokey bloke, red blooded male. Love my footy, love all, all that sort of stuff. Mm. But um, a big softy as well. And, and, and um, I've always, I've always enjoyed, uh, I suppose, 
looking out for those who, who have been able to look out for themselves and helping helping people. And um, there was a, just a natural affinity um, for for working with children, and it's it it was something that I enjoyed doing. But it's only something that I suppose in the last four or five years that I've actually realised I'm super passionate about my. It's like I've become more passionate about it uh, each year that I've that I've taught, and absolutely loving it now. Especially when you're not scrambling, um, you know, especially in the early years, scrambling to just survive each week, got to get the lessons together and all the rest. Now yeah. it's now it's almost playtime, like <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Become a bit of an old hand at a few things. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so obviously, I mean, you, you love your tech, you love your science and whatnot, and I definitely want to dive right into sort of your thoughts around, yeah. um, you know, science and things in the classroom. So, you know, just yeah. ask flat out, I mean, what's some of the best sort of science lessons you've seen run in a primary context? Yeah, look, I, I, I'm going to jump back a second, actually. Oh. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me give you half a step back and, sure. and that will help me answer, answer that question. No problem. Uh, as... as as you you probably know, and as of some of the people listening in, um, one of the ways that I, I have been able to connect with people has been um, very much on Twitter, but then uh, also a few through uh, a few other online sort of things. Predominantly, predominantly through Twitter. A few years ago, I set up a uh, a thing called Aussie Ed hashtag Aussie Ed, and that was a Twitter chat and. Uh, a, it was right time, right place, and, and uh, Aussie Ed grew to be, you know, one of the actually more successful Twitter chats, definitely the largest Twitter chat in Australia and um, almost one of the largest uh, uh, in the world. It's one of, certainly one yeah. of the, um, you know, the more popular Twitter chats globally. We get, uh, you know, tens of thousands of, of, of teachers joining in every Sunday night. But if I let you know why that actually began, how Please. that actually began. So a few years ago, um, five or six years ago now, I was uh, teaching at a little primary school um, over in the suburbs of Sydney. And we were one of the first four schools to do in Sydney, that is four schools in Sydney, to do a trial with um, uh, one-to-one iPads. Yep. So we were moving into a brand new thing that Google had uh, released called GAFE, and I know a lot of people will be very familiar with the Google Apps for Education nowadays. But it was it was sort of brand new, and even the word cloud and what was cloud technology and so confusing and so strange and so obscure. Uh, and we were sort of right at the uh, cutting edge of of using that technology and. It was great and a very exciting time, but what I quickly learned was that the usual channels for being able to discuss things, being able to try things and, and, and talk about, like sitting in the in the um, in, in stuff room and, and, and your usual sort of network of teachers, no longer gave me the sorts of answers that I needed because so a few other people I knew uh, were delving into the sorts of pedagogies that now. Uh, I face in this um, digital environment. So I only had one place to turn and that was online and and there were some online communities and I was able to really um, meet in with those people and, and, and connect with those people and uh, I saw so much of what was already happening uh, in places like America where a few um, chats were set up and there were a few really niche sort of um, talks happening in Australia and what I was able to do was, again, cherry pick yeah. Um, what I liked that I saw happening around the globe and actually create uh, a model that at the time was quite unique uh, and at the time no one else was really doing and it struck a chord with uh, a lot more people than I thought. I remember around my first Twitch chat, I think we had about 20-odd people. And the second one we had about 70. The third one we had about 2,000 and then 10,000 and, then, you know, it just went, it just went ballistic. So and if you talk about exponential. Oh, and if uh, listen, you've never, ever jumped on a Twitter chat on, on, on hashtag Aussie Ed, it is insane. I've got no idea how you keep up with it. I almost feel like I know you've got a, a number of teachers to help you out. I almost feel like you should give them a shout out. <laughs> well, I do have, a, do have a fantastic team. And in, in the early days, we had a team of uh, 10 teachers from all over, all over Australia. That's now as people's careers have, have moved on and they've taken new appointments. But I've got to say, uh, you know, Alex, uh, a, a teacher that I know, I'm fortunate enough to actually uh, 
have her teach uh, one of my own children actually f- several oh, years ago. Zena Charles did that for you. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So Zena taught my kid, and then uh, Zena and I are also teamed up as just part of Aussie Ed. I've got Rob McTaggart, so uh, yeah. a man from uh, rural, rural New South Wales, or not truly rural, but um, regional Australia, let's just say, yeah. regional Australia up in Newcastle. And then we've got Maggie Matson. Uh, Magdalene, who's um, another sort of Sydney girl. And then I know we're talking about science and probably one of the best science teachers I know, um, Kelly Hobson, Kelly Hollis, uh, as she goes by now. So probably the probably the best, most um, amazing science teacher that, that that I know, actually, Kelly. So fantastic team, just people who have become, you know, my best friends in the world, to be honest with you. They're a great bunch of people and have been able to create something truly special uh, with them. Well, that's it. And this is a STEM tab too. So going down technology is completely fine. The, um, yeah. I can see why you grabbed a cord. I mean, because, I mean, we know about the teach meets that now happen, but you have to, you've got to actually make an effort to get to there on time at this particular place. Yeah. Whereas Twitter is down yeah. an app, it's free and off you go. Yeah. Yeah, no wonder it's gone. Yeah. Zena, Zena coined a phrase once, um, and it's taken off. I see the hashtag now get used all the time, but um, I'm pretty pretty sure it was Zena the first time I ever heard it anyway, uh, whether she came out with it, I think she did, uh, was uh, with the hashtag uh, PD in your PJs, PD in PJs. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that's the law. You can, you can sit down in, in, in your pyjamas, you've got your cup of tea, you have a slice of toast and, You've watched the news, the kids are in bed and you can sit and, and get inspired. And, and this whole tangent of conversation mm, started because fine. you said to me, you know, some good lessons. Mm. I tell you now, what's happened on from meeting and connecting with people on Twitter is that I've been, you know, so rarely do we actually get to see what's happening in the classrooms uh, next door. And, and, and okay. sometimes you, you, you can be with a person for years and, and not really know what happens in their, in their classrooms. You know what sort of type of person they are, but not always what they are. Yeah. Uh, like, but online there is the, the – oh, sorry. No, no, I agree. Now, what you're saying is completely right. I mean, one of the things that grabbed my um, attention when I was talking with the Education Changemaker team uh, out of Melbourne, oh, yeah. uh, that, they've got a phrase, which I'm, I'm not sure if they've coined, but, gee, they've taken on board, is collective genius. It is simply just there is so much around, you just got to tap into it. So, so many people are doing so much cool stuff. Well, that, and, and that's, a, that's the beautiful phrase for, I suppose, that goes with what I was about to say was that you are inspired on a, on a weekly or daily basis, but mm. online, the 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 generosity and the enthusiasm and the love and the desire to truly actually share and collaborate with people and network with people on forums like Twitter mm. uh, just is is otherworldly. I've never experienced anything like it. So it's you've got your your teachers who are the most keen, the most passionate, the most willing to want to learn new things and but share what they're also doing. Um, and, and you can't help but be inspired. Well, you've got all these, you know, highly motivated teachers with a lot of knowledge to share. And I'm thinking about just the curation of this knowledge. I mean, this, this stream can get out of hand, like it trends every single time. Mm. And you, you guys jump on Sunday nights, Australian time. How do you collate it so that people who miss the chat, you get the goodness? Yeah, well, so we've got we've all got different roles within the team, and Maggie <laughs> Maggie is fantastic. So Maggie often will um, she archives the chats with a, a tool called Storify that you'd probably be familiar with. Yes. But um, uh, for those people, for the uninitiated, um, Storify is a, is a little tool, and what what it does is actually you can put in a, a time frame of a of a hashtag, and it will capture. Uh, the tweets that you want, and you can actually handpick um, the tweets as well, but you can basically um, capture entire conversations between a, a, a period of time and, and store them as, as like a story. And then people can actually go back and go through it. So on the Aussie uh, website, you know, obviously aussied.com, you, you can go and there literally be a couple of hundred almost. Chats, you, you know, you want, you want to look at STEM, you look up here at STEM, you, go, you know, flipped learning, you know. So you've, got, you, you've, you've just got all, all the different sorts of conversations, the, the huge variety that we have had yeah. or archive there that, that people are actually able to go to and peruse in their own time. 
So it's almost too hard. So I'm trying to, like, you've got that much volume of just little tweaks going on and um, trying to work out which ones really grab people's fancy might be difficult because there's so much content happening these mm-hmm. days. At least thinking about the different chats, I mean, obviously they've got a theme every week. Which one has just clearly just touched the nerve of teachers and it just, it's just gone berserk? Do you know what? Different, different themes for different people and uh, uh, Quite often you, you'll have a theme, and it's very, very hard to predict. And, and, and there are some people, usually people who are quite um, high up within their own, um, I suppose, system or network, sometimes are very frustrated by a, a, a Twitter chat because I always call a Twitter chat is a great leveller. You yeah. could have uh, someone who has PhD, you could have someone who's got 30 years' experience in the classroom. You can have someone who's been out just teaching for a couple of years and you've got your previous teacher all within the same classroom. And sometimes the, the people who um, maybe are used to getting up and because they've got that authoritative position within their workplace are used to saying something and then just having everyone there sitting and nodding and almost too frightened to, to challenge what's being said and challenge what's being uh, put forward. Twitter, in its levelling sort of way, people aren't judged by who they are. They're judged by the ideas that they bring to the table. So it's the it's the idea and the concept that gets talked about, not the pedigree of the person perhaps um, proposing it. So it's a, it is a huge leveller. It can be a little bit um, disorientating uh, for some people. Yeah. Well, the thing is, though, I completely agree. Like, uh, you see there's a lot of conferences these days where there's almost this back channel happening. Yeah. A whole other conference happening even in the same room. And especially it's really handy for the introspective that, I mean, I'm so, uh, people may disagree, I suppose, but, but um, I, I actually don't, I actually, for myself, I actually don't mind hiding in a corner, just typing away and doing stuff. And um, it actually helps just for people who want to just get their word out in a quiet way, they can do so. Yeah, when you say like, um, you know, what what has resonated with people, what often resonates with people the most is not necessarily the mainstream of the chat. And like, as as you say, you know, a chat, particularly a big chat like Aussie Ed will will, will trend and trend sometimes in multiple countries. Mm. Uh, But what really is the power is the side conversation. So if yeah. someone puts something up, like if, if Ben, if you've posted something that, that physics is done or, or something that you're, you're trying at, at home or in your class, I can sort of ask you a, a further question and we might set up a little bit of a messaging or yeah. say, hey, can I ask you a little bit further and share an email? And and, and the, the phrase, the coined phrase is sort of side chat and obviously everyone understands what that, that, that would sort of reference. But those side chats that happen in parallel with the main chat, I think are actually really where the power of the chat comes from. It is. And what's cool about it is that, um, I mean, for example, um, you'll then meet up with these people months, years mm. in the future even. Like I ran into some teachers I ran into at a different, like a, I think it was a science chat um, at a conference in Atlanta, uh, East, East for I mean, I don't know, Brett, you're all over East, you know exactly what I'm talking about, the National Society for Technology mm. Education Conferences. And I ran into some teachers that I've been speaking with previously. Oh, gosh. As, oh, you're here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of weird to be to meet people in person. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. So, um, just just out of interest, I mean, obviously, I mean, this is the thing you've been teaching for twenty years. So, yep. trying to single out different things that have worked brilliantly well in the class from a science perspective. I'm just trying to think. Imagine if you had a first year, first year. You know, they're still at university, uh, mm-hmm. finishing off their you know, pre service teacher, about to hit the world, mm-hmm. and you. You just, you just want to give them like, you know, a couple of experiments going, you know what, I want you to give this one a go because I know the kids are going to love this. Oh, experiments. Yeah, oh, okay. like well, those are the ones that you go, oh, you know what, it doesn't have to be fancy, over the top and, you know, wild and bubbly. Just things that you go, you go, you know what, every single year I run this, every time I actually run this experiment, 
it's just one that grabs the kid's attention. Yeah. Yeah. And I know it's kind of hard because like, you're almost being put on the spot because you got I am, I am, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you didn't warn me about this, mate. What are you doing? <laughs> Tell me, you, get a, you needed to whisper that one in, in, at the beginning before no, we no. press the record. Like, this is the thing. Like, I mean, I think about um, when we get, uh, like I often get uh, new, new people come in um, as science communicators at, at work and yep. they'll, they'll ask, what's, what's my favourite experiment? I give them this blanket. Look, hang on. Yeah. How do I? So many question. All right. So, um, I mean, for no, example, no, no, I'll, I'll tell you now. It's just me. But um, just before I got on to talk with you, and he, for those people who who didn't know, we had a little bit of a, a hiccup just trying to get out audio and sound and all that sort of stuff, just jiggling it. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to be going off to a conference. I'm very excited to go to in Texas uh, called yes. iPad Palooza. Oh, yeah. Now. I've got a day to myself before the conference starts and I'm going to be in Austin and I'm just checking out, will I be able to get all the way over to Houston to go to the NASA Space Centre? I'll do it. And should I rent a car and just zip on over? I'm half tempted to see if I can just spin a car, to be honest with you, or just find a little place. I was just on there seeing if they had, like, you know how, like, you can have at the zoo roar and snore and you get to stay? Yes. I was just thinking, oh, I wonder if there's, like, a, a sleep at the Space Centre sort Ooh, of evening yeah. I can pay for. There's sort of something. This is actually sort of a heads up for later on. Oh. We've got, I've got a conference lining up, uh, a chat like this, um, line up with Jackie Silvero. Uh, oh, I'm a big fan of Jackie. Yeah, Jackie's cool. She runs, She's involved with space camps. She sure is. She yeah. sure is. She is an absolute rock star. Yeah. That's a, that, that'll be an interesting one for people to tune into because she's fantastic. Oh, uh, she uh, so, uh, actually, even just talking to her, just organising this thing, I'm going, I don't even know how I'm going to even fit your mm. own in whatever time we're going to do here. Um, yeah, she's, she's yes. a pretty special woman. Look, if you um, can get yourself some time in, in Houston, do so. Well, and, and that's it. And I suppose I've always been fascinated by space and, and, and rockets and all those, all, all those fantastic things. So if I was going to pick experiments to just have those little wow, just those wow factors, uh, I, I think just about every – I've taught for a long time. I've taught for now, like I say, for 20 years. But I've taught stage three. Yeah. What seems like for an eternity. I've taught year five and year six uh, for more times than I can count. I'm, I've only yeah. been teaching for for twenty years, and I think I've taught year six for forty years. You know, <laughs> I'm sure it adds up strangely, but mm. um, so I've taught. You know, the, some of those key, really, really common. Like I've, I've taught gold lots of times. I know my bush yeah. rangers off by heart. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've taught Antarctica a million times. I've taught space a lot of times. So there are some of those experiments that you do with space that are just fantastic. You mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, those, those little tea bag things and it just yes. floats yes. up the ash and the kid's like, whoa, whoa. But even, even when you're just doing, doing the little balloon rockets, sort of with the straw taped on the front and you're zipping Absolutely. across and you can start talking about, you know, jet propulsion, all that sort of stuff and, uh, you know, equal forces and yes. opposite reaction and things like that. But um, I, the last few times that I have um, taught space, yeah. I made these little, these little rockets that just had um, – the, the red stuff or the red chemical off the matches. Oh, yeah. Uh, it made like a little cylinder out of uh, our foil and you put them on like a little bamboo skewer yep. and you've got a big safety sort of um, barbecue lighter and you, just, you start it, you heat up the heat up the um, the the chemical that's, that happens to be in, in there and these, the little rocket shoot off and the kids have gone, berserk with it but what's been fantastic is especially with with the use of all the devices that they have now and and, and whatnot they can film it and uh the last two years that i've taught the kids like capturing the the rocket launch off the bamboo skewer in in slow motion and and then collating their experiments and collating uh their knowledge and making like a mini documentary so they've been, they're able to sort of voice over, narrate 
their own learning. They've got this beautiful uh, digital resource that, that is, is, a, is a reflection of their, their learning. It's like a journal, I suppose, of their learning. But mm-hmm. they've got their own footage. So they're not just downloading stuff off YouTube, which we love to do. And, um, you know, they're not just consuming content but they're actually creating their own content. So it's, it's, it's tangible. They're getting in, they're making their experiments, but then they're actually building their own, their own sort of content as well. In the project. And for me, that's magic. That works really well because the beauty about filming something like this is that because there's a little time, you know, it measures the time of the video as it goes along because you've got X number of frames, um, especially uh, upper primary, you know, gifted kids, or if you're teaching in high school, you could use that to calculate acceleration. Oh, there you go. I you hadn't to- even thought about that. You totally could do that. If you set up a grid, a grid behind it, try it next time. There you go. So, set up, set up like go. some sort of, oh, as I knock the microphone, so there goes bang in the microphone, but um, I got excited. Um, but if you had set up a grid just behind it and you then film it, you've got, it's got the set seconds running along. Oh, and you could totally work out the acceleration cool. if that's you want to get cool. And uh, there's that's a space space cool. geeky if you wish. Um, <laughs> but, um, well, that's, and that's why I'm half tempted. And I, I think I'm talking myself into it. And I literally was doing it just as we were starting to chat. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking I'm, I've got to go over the, to Houston and yeah. grab as many resources and make a, a couple of contacts while I'm there. Yeah. Because I've got space again in term four. Look, uh, <laughs> seriously, the iPad, just going down the iPad thing, I mean, I could talk rockets all the time. Like okay, one of my okay. favourite thing is doing bicarbon vinegar rockets with uh, the film canister, which you can mm-hmm. still get on eBay. Do you know what? I've never actually done that. You seriously? Because, well, because I, I don't know where we get from canisters. There's, eBay. there's heaps of eBay. eBay is your friend. Well, in fact, we only just ordered like 40 of them for about oh, 25 bucks from somewhere. Um, each, uh, I mean, if you want, you know, just jump on the physics website, type bicarb rocket or something, you're going to find it. Just type in rocket. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but the um, beauty about it is if, you've, if you vary the amount of vinegar within your, your, your film canister, you can then ask the kid, if I fill the thing up full with vinegar, and you put a bicarb paste in, obviously we're wearing protective glasses and not taking our eyes out. Will it go higher as a compared to halfway or nearly empty of vinegar? So you've got the same amount of bicarb and you're varying only one thing, which is your vinegar. Always, without fail, kids will always say the more vinegar will go higher. Without fail, it's, just, it's on tap, they'll say it every time. Yeah. But it's too heavy. I mean, turns out it is actually rocket science. <laughs> actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, there we go, boom, boom. But it's, it's, you actually, you do, the kids can actually do variable testing. Um, but just going with your iPad thing, I mean, I'd love to go to that conference. Um, mm-hmm. I'm off to San, San Antonio this year as well, and maybe I should do like a detour or something. Well, yes, the, uh, I'm uh, arguing between visiting the Alamo or the Houston Space Center. So, <laughs> oh, gee, what big you choices. Um, but so I've got to get a Davy Crockett coonskin hat and visit the Alamo as well, hey? Oh, that'd be just awesome. I mean, I feel like, I mean, it's not every day you go down there. Uh, I'm just going to have to go check. Maybe I'm going to have to do both. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but um, going with your iPad thing, just yes, we, go. we use iPads. I mean, we, we love an app. We all love an app. Mm. Um you can still get apps which will act, okay, they're called, it's called an oscilloscope. Um, I think it's oscope light or something like this. But oscilloscope, it measures sound. It uses the, it uses the microphone off your iPad and you can mm-hmm. teach sound waves using just simply just a simple green line which will respond to your sound. And if you play pure notes at it, um, the kids can see wavelength and amplitude, like, you know, frequency and amplitude directly off their own voices. We um, were at a conference, a video conference to a school in New York and they were blown away that we'll connect up the iPad and kids in New York were controlling my iPad and they were seeing the wavelengths wow. coming back at them. It was very neat. It's completely free. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you what, in the show notes, we'll throw some stuff down for people to check that out. Oh, fantastic. But fantastic. iPads are very, very cool. Um, yeah. yeah. And like, for anyone who is interested in checking out something like uh, iPad Palooza, hmm. I do happen to know that... Um, uh, the very awesome Kathy Hunt and great lot of teachers uh, up there at St Hilda's uh, mm-hmm. on the Gold Coast. Every second year, they've actually uh, almost, I suppose, franchised out right. the Australian version of iPad Palooza. So they did it for the first time last year, and it, on on a sort of bi yearly thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll actually have iPad Palooza. I mean, it's a long wait. You've got to wait another twelve months, but. But in 2018, if you're keen to go and check out iPad Palooza on the Gold Coast, uh, you could have a lot of fun. 
And the problem is, though, we can actually, I might actually just, the issue also is that there's so many shiny new toys that come out. And that's probably half the issue is that it's, it's almost keeping focus on what, what, what works in your classroom as well. Yeah. Well, do you know what? Okay. You, funny, funny you say that because I think well, you, you asked me before about, you know, what advice to give to um, yeah. a, you know, a young teacher. And we're, we're talking about some, some really cool stuff. Oh, you could do this, you could do that. At the end of the day, the quality of the pedagogy far outweighs that has to has to come before the flashy tool. Exactly, uh, it, it's it's too easy, and and it's a trap that's way too easy to fall into. You can get all sorts of tools and all sorts of games and all sorts of activities and and things like that. But if it doesn't enhance the learning of the children, why would you do it? They, they've got heaps of time to be entertained and have fun and play games and all that sort of stuff. There's loads of time for that. The time that we have with them in the classroom for explicit teaching and, and uh, you know, direct instruction, all that sort of stuff is so short and so pure and so special. Mm. You don't want to devalue that by using a tool that it really isn't actually going to have an impact on their learning. So, you know, that, that old phrase, pedagogy first, technology second. Now, I'm a massive ed tech fan. I, I'm, I'm, I'm checking out every tool there is, but do you know what? Advice for the for the um, teachers starting up, don't get distracted. Pedagogy first, technology second, where it's appropriate. I completely agree. And actually, um, some, something that can come up is often there's all that, let's make this experiment better, let's make it better, let's make it better. But year five, that you get new five, set of year fives every year, there comes a point when it's like, you know what, let's just do the experiment, make sure the kids knows what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's probably yeah. not a bad idea. It's, um, yes. no, nah, it's true. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple trap to, to get caught in, but, um, but I'm yet to meet a single teacher who's been work who's been in the classroom for greater than five years who's not said that. Everyone says this, and it's very true. Um, often, when we're first going in, we see see all this cool stuff. And it's like the world's your oyster, and we want to start using all these yeah. experiment things. But it comes a point when it's just enough's enough. <laughs> in some ways, though going to conferences like the one you're going to, you're going to find some fun stuff too. Exactly right. Exactly right. You've got to, uh, I'm sure there's a, 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 a perfect idiom for that, but you've, you've got to sort out the diamonds from the rough, I suppose. But um, yeah. Well, that's it. And actually conversely, and this is a thing that it often comes up in these podcasts is, yeah, it can, it's great to talk about all the wins that you have in your classroom. But um, I kind of feel like it's only really half the story. I mean, mm-hmm. um, it's, I mean, what comes with the experience is usually the times when things just don't go well. <laughs> yeah. Um, just, just out of interest. And again, I'm just throwing you on the spot because, mm-hmm. hey, why not? <laughs> oh, yeah. but, um, but have you ever had a time where you've gone, you know what, I, know, I really feel this, 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 this science this experiment is going to grab the kids' attention. It's going to be perfect. I reckon it's going to be so awesome. And it's just fallen flat. It's just gone maybe you shouldn't have done that one. Yeah. Maybe you should have approached it a different way. Look, I suppose in primary science, not necessarily the experiments per se, but um, sometimes the learning experiences that I've tried to structure around um, the experiments is with, within science. So like the, the follow-up lessons, the activities, the way, the way they're going to document and, yeah. and things like that. Uh, it's very difficult sometimes to predict how long students are going to take on, on, on set oh, tasks. Yeah, very and t- timing is so crucial. And then often in science, like it will be prescribed a, a set amount of time and, and different schools will have different amounts per term. And I'm sure it always adds up to what the, uh, you know, the appropriate authority sort of says, says that it will. But, um, you know, you're pigeonholed into, into a certain time and you think I'm going to allocate X amount of time and X amount of lessons. Yep. And then the children or some of the children – uh, go really fast and others go really slow and, and, and there might have been a failed experiment or someone away and they need to redo it and then all of a sudden uh, you've got different children at different levels and, uh, and different, um, I suppose, uh, parts of completion. That's right. And then so often in the in, – and then so you, you find yourself rushing and chasing your tail 
just to get it done, just to go, all right, done, 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 everyone's got to get it done. But then, and then you know what you lose? You lose the opportunity to have that reflection. Right. Uh, and if, if I'm going to say to something and put my hand up and, and own, you know, what, what have I, what are I balls up sometimes? It's yeah. probably, it's probably, I haven't really, uh, I suppose, managed my time sequencing uh, over, over the length of a program appropriately and given myself or given the children the opportunity to reflect and, and go, you know what, what did I learn here? And if I had the opportunity, what could I do better? Like, I've just done a, a, a great unit, fantastic unit on design. We're building bridges and, and trying to make products that could stand strong and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but I <laughs> fell into that same old trap. And mm. it would be beautiful to be able to have that ability to go back and say, okay, <laughs> this is what we learned, yeah. this is what worked, this is what went well, this is what struggled. Let's have another crack at it and actually see, apply those learnings to what you've got and and see how good it is. And it's just so hard sometimes. I love what you just went into rather than just singling out one experiment. Like that is a global issue across Mm. what anything happens. I mean, I can think of um, biggest issues, fine motor skills. Can Mm -hmm. the child tie a balloon? And actually I I found over the years it's getting harder for kids that are particularly (laughs) tie balloons. Uh, Can the child use a pair of scissors and well? Um, The craft materials that are around your science thing that you're making inevitably are are like the bottlenecks of your experiment. I mean, this is all about free admission. Very true. We only just came out of our holiday science programs and we thought, oh, let's just try a different version of a rubber band powered car. And, you know, we put it together and to be honest, there was an absolute push at the end to make sure that this version was actually going to get out with a bunch of 11 year olds. It was just what we thought wasn't quite what was good. It was going to work. You know, it needed refining like then and there. And, wow. um, and you know, we've been doing this for years. And so yeah. it's just, it's, it, that's the thing. It's, it's not just about, I feel it's not just at, not just about the reflection of the learning for the kids, which is critical. It's on the yeah. drive, it's on the drive on the way home going, what did you do right and what did yeah. you not do right? Spot on. <laughs> that actually Spot on. matters. Being part of it. Yeah. And, um, Being part of it. Yeah. And, and it, it takes a bit to do because, I mean, um, I've come to some places where they've, had, they've done a certain particular thing and they've asked for some advice and you give them some advice about how to run a particular experiment and then you visit the next year and go, how are you, how are you doing it now? Oh, we're still doing it this way. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what? It's funny. A um, person, uh, a, a, a leader... An educational leader I, I, I met once and a uh, beautiful lady or worked with her for a, a period of time and very tough, very hard, um, always challenging you to think uh, more when you, even when you want to just to go easy, she's always challenged. Um, and she said once, like, um, have you been teaching, let's say 20 years because I've used that number now, have you been t- teaching 20 years or have you just taught the same year 20 times? Oh, yeah. And, 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 you know, like what are we learning? What are we improving? Are, are, are we becoming masters of our profession or are we just, you know, recycling? What, you know, here's my program from last year, press print, go through the motions and, and, and do it again. So um, I suppose that's it. You know, you, you hear those, um, that, that magic number, 10,000 hours, 10,000 yes. hours to become a, 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 a at something. Uh, so 10,000 hours of continuous learning and improvement as opposed to, you know, one year of uh, work and just repeating those same things over and over. Well, that's true, isn't it? The old, um, it's not quite a cliche saying, so I don't think it's a saying, but the idea that you can tell a person when they graduated based on their haircut and their clothes <laughs> and where they're teaching. <laughs> <laughs> some, yeah. some people, some maybe not, but it's, a, it's certainly um, teaching styles do change and ways of doing yeah. it do change. And this whole flipped learning thing, I mean, I know you're big on this, like looking, going down that area as well as, I mean, that wasn't around. Well, no. Yeah, and, and, and I'm, I'm – actually, it's funny. I'm only on the precipice of it. I've, mm. I've got a couple of videos. And well, do you know what? It's funny. I was only thinking about flip learning just the other day. And I, and I suppose I've tried it uh, more often than I, than I probably give myself credit for. Uh, but there are people doing amazing things. Mm. Oh, there are. It's It's – I suppose, I mean, it's just all, it's, it's also can be just a label. It's true. 
Well, and then you've got buzzwords and fads and all that sort of stuff. But um, I, I was getting, you know, I mentioned before Kelly Hollis, I'll give her another shout out because um, biology, bi- she's teaching biology uh, this year and uh, she has a flipped video for every single syllabus dot point uh, for her HSC class. That's awesome. So I was just thinking, I said to her the other day, I said, you know what, I was a lazy kid when I did my HSC. Yeah. I would have had nothing there. If I was forced to study and mum was yelling at you, go on, study, go there. And you had to sit down, open up the laptop, watch YouTube and just and see the, the video. Is that not going to be the best way of studying in the world? Like, surely. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, gosh. And actually, that, that segues nicely, actually, into something I really wanted to just chat you about because I know you've yeah. got a new project going on when it comes to this type of thing. Um, and maybe tell people a bit more about what's going on. Yeah. So, uh, got this, I think, fantastic idea. Uh, I think it's a fantastic idea. I think it sounds great. <laughs> so, I'm teaming up with Rob McTaggart, who I, uh, I mentioned earlier. Mm-hmm. And Rob and I are doing this project called World STEM. And we had a bit of a, a, a think and, um, you know, obviously both passionate about STEM environments and, and not even getting into argument of STEAM and STEM and all that. Yeah, that that's a debate for another time. But um, World STEM, we thought, well, what are the barriers? What are the real hurdles that teachers have mm. in trying to get STEM happening uh, authentically in their classroom? And, and, you know, what we came up with three things. So one is, you know, it, it can cost a lot. Yeah, people think uh, I'm excluded from being able to do STEM because I can't buy several thousand dollars worth of robots or I can't buy all this sort of stuff. So that's one immediate barrier that people think uh, is there. And then there's a whole other thing of you just you don't know what you don't know. So yeah. uh, if there are lessons and activities and things that, that, that are out there to be done and doing, whether we're talking coding or, yeah. or whether we're talking uh, different aspects of, you know, um, you know science and, and, and whatnot, if you're unaware of those, then obviously, clearly, you, you can't be implementing those in your classroom. And then even if you do have those ideas, I suppose this comes back to pedagogy first, yeah. even if you do have these cool things, uh, how on earth do you make sure it fits into the curriculum? We were talking before about that, that precious time that we have. We don't want to waste that precious time. So trying to overcome us those three things, you know, the cost, yeah. um, you know, what is there out there and and how do I really map it in, in, into my What's effective. So what we came up with was this concept of a world STEM challenge. Yep. Uh, and we were talking before uh, about this very chat about finding out, you know, what's happening in the classroom next door. The world STEM challenge is a call globally to say to all of the teachers who are having successes with STEM in their classroom, Let's share those successes. So make a video, one minute, two minute, three minute, no big deal. Yeah. Um, make a short video uh, and in that video describe the lesson, describe your STEM experience, what you've done with your class. Uh, let, us, let, let the world sort of know about it. Tell us what worked. Tell us what was a challenge. Um, show some of the kids' works. Get the kids involved in the video if you want and then Bring that, you know, link that, you know, put it on YouTube or, or, or however you want to host your video. Yeah. And send us the link at, at World STEM and we're going to make a cachet of all of the best uh, STEM-related lessons um, that, that we can gather um, globally from educators. So even conservatively, if we can get 50 videos or 100 videos or 150 videos over the next few months, Literally, we'll have a one-stop shop where a teacher who, oh, goodness, I'm hearing this all this buzz about STEM, but I don't know how to do it and I'm not sure. You can go on here and see top-notch lessons from educators around the world, have a little bit of a look and go, you know what, I like that one. Yeah. And then you can either replicate that or you can link with the person who did it and say, hey, well, you know, link further and have that, that extra conversation. Matt, I've got a funny feeling you're going to get more than 50 or 100 videos here. Mate. Well, I think even, that's what I mean, even, conservative, even conservatively, uh, if that's all that happens, already what a great gift to, to the educators of the world. Just 
just that small amount. And I'm, I'm hoping with like you, I'm, you know, looking through rose colored glasses. I'm, I'm hoping to be inundated and, and being a huge success. So over the next few months, um, I'm going to be trying to bang that world STEM challenge uh, drum as much as I can uh, in the hope that um, people go and check out World STEM. And you can check out World STEM. You can join on Twitter yeah. and, and look at World STEM EDU, so at World STEM EDU. Or you can go to the, the website, website, which is worldstem.co. Yeah. Uh, and there's instructions on the website there on, on what to do. Now, we're more than happy to um, help that out as well. I mean, that is an awesome idea. And, look, these um, video ch- these videos are fantastic. And it's actually the framework. It made, made me think about um, Alan Alder's uh, Flame Challenge. Have you heard about that? No, I haven't. No, please oh, share. Do you know, and there'll be some listeners who would be aware of this. It's a new, new thing um, that... Uh, Alan Alder um, of MASH fame and other fame as well. <laughs> Alan, yeah. around for a while, but, um, he set up this challenge, which was a simple, which was um, called the Flame Challenge. I'm probably going to explain this complete, a bit, not perfect, but the Flame Challenge was explain what a flame is in a video simplistically so that an 11 year old can understand it. I'm pretty sure it was an 11 year old. I hope wow. it was. So the idea was that it was just a science communication challenge. So you got all types of scientists and science and museum types and teachers trying to come up with an experiment which was going to be to explain it flame to an 11-year-old, but more critically, because it was a challenge, it was going to be voted on by 11-year-olds. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's a nice twist, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so I definitely recommend you check out the flame challenge. And, um, and I actually got me thinking about, well, the world STEM. And they're just going to, you got these best videos. It's, it'd be interesting that these are the lessons. I wonder, wouldn't it be cool with the, some of the, the kids sort of seeing this? But that's just a, a little side thought. I was just yeah. at the same time. No, no, no. Ah, that's, I reckon that's brilliant. And certainly World's to, at WorldSTEM EDU, please jump on Twitter and do it. And actually, you know what? If, if you're listening in and going, I haven't done this Twitter thing, it's worth doing this Twitter thing. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it is. It, it, it is. It, it can be. Uh, don't don't feel overwhelmed. Like most people join the chats, uh, we'll we'll do what we call lurking, <laughs> and it sounds more insidious than the, than what it is. <laughs> but um, it, just lurk online. So come online if you want to follow someone. I'm happy for you to follow me. I can follow back uh, as often as I can. And so I'm at Mr. Salakis, capital M, capital R, Salakis. Uh, and we've got the Aussie Ed chats, but there's a, there's a myriad of, of, of other chats. Aussie Ed is very broad, yeah. and we look at uh, as many, a, a huge variety of, of, of different educational things. But if you're into computer science, there are computer science chats. If you're into English, there are English chats, you know, religious studies, all that sort of stuff. Uh, go on there and you, and you can just type the hashtag and you can observe uh, what's happening. You can lurk on the chat and, and see what's happening. And then once you get brave enough, you can sort of start participating and, and tweeting out and, and joining in all, all the fun. But I'll tell you what, talk about a way to reinvigorate your own teaching and you go back to what Zena said, PD in PJs, you can get to it. In your own in in your own safe environment, you're not forced to go off um, somewhere where you're going to be bored. Uh, you tune in if it's you're loving it and you love it, and if it's not your night, you can turn it off and watch um, the Real Housewives or something. You know? well, it's a thing you can learn and and discover and create at any time. I mean, it's eleven o'clock at night. Maybe we should be calling this podcast in PJs right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those wondering, no, we are completely dressed in normal clothes but, but uh, well, I'm in my PJs but I won't go that. that's right that's why we only only got the, the camera frame on your face <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, thank you very much, Brett, for popping on in. And I know you're a spectacularly busy person. I mean, tomorrow night is another Aussie Ed night. What's, I mean, just obviously by the time this podcast is well out of theme, but we're, we're yeah. just out of interest. What's tomorrow night? Because I'm, I'm you know, it's pop in. Well, tomorrow it's a funny one, actually. We were going to have uh, Alma Harris, uh, mm-hmm. who, um, for those of you who, uh, you know, who, uh, who know, Alma is just um, probably one of my inspirations uh she's welsh she's a welsh educator researcher Mm -hmm. Uh, she was the person who really opened my eyes to uh looking at the pisa results from another angle uh Mm -hmm. several years ago and 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 being able to scratch 
that surp- surface and go a little bit deeper yep. with some of that. But um, she was going to be on because she's coming out to Australia. She's going to be on uh, and, and talking about leadership. Unfortunately, her flight's been changed and she's still going to be in the air during the Aussie Ed chat. Oh, no. Uh, I've only found out and so it's a little bit short to, to get another rock star um, mm. to join in. So it's going to be an in-house special with the Aussie Ed team. And Little Birdie told me that it's um, Eurovision Song Contest at the, uh, at, at the moment. So we're going to have a Eurovision themed night so it will be quite interesting and very left of field uh but bringing in some real world uh things into our education just like we do with the children uh connecting their learning with actually the real world around them so tomorrow night's party night (laughs) Uh, yeah yeah hopefully it'll be a little bit of fun hopefully it'll be a little bit of fun but actually some some big heavy issues at the same time no, that's fantastic. And obviously all these information throughout the podcast be thrown in the show notes. We'll definitely do that. And, um, look, obviously you can connect with, uh, is it, it's at Mr. Salakis, if I can remember correctly. At Mr. Salakis. I've been called Mr. Salakis for so long. I just, just, you call me that. <laughs> no worries. So that's, you know, is there anyone else, any way else you want people to get in contact with you? Or is that the best spot? Oh, look, do you know what? Mm-hmm. Twitter addict, that's the fastest way to get to me. Obviously you can get the, all, all the other usual channels, LinkedIn and whatnot, but, um, fastest way to get in contact with well, me is probably uh, via Twitter. Look, uh, thank you very much for popping along. It's been a pleasure having a chat and um, yeah. have a fantastic rest of your weekend, mate. You, know, you too, brother. You too. It's been good fun and it's great to have a giggle uh, <laughs> this late at night and really geek out and, and talk about what we're passionate about. So fantastic. And I hope um, anyone listening into the, the podcast actually got some value out of uh, anything I happen to say. So uh, appreciate you inviting me on and I appreciate anyone who's listening in. Uh, much appreciated, man. Have a good one. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're all about science, ed tech and more. To see 100 fun free experiments you can do with your class, go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F-I-Z-Z-I-C-S. And click 100 free experiments. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview. It was a bit of a longer one, but Brett Solarkis is a really accomplished educator and he's really put together a fantastic group of teachers who are highly motivated and wow, look what can come out of it. I mean, thousands of teachers globally. I mean, that's certainly going well beyond your classroom. Well done, mate. Really proud of you. And just you know, nailing it. So obviously there's a lot of things we could learn from it, but I just thought I'd just at least summarize three of these just to maybe you know, it's a take-home project. Homework, if you will. So here's our guest, homework number one, education tip number one, get involved in Twitter. Okay, I know that some people aren't that big on social media. Look, I get it. But you're possibly missing out on a lots of information that is really freely available. And like, it's not even just about information, just even making connections and meeting up with colleagues who are outside the four walls and fences of your schools is a great thing. Get involved with Twitter, you know, create a hashtag, don't have to show your name, don't have to say where you're from, but you will find these valuable. So there's your number one tip for me, especially out of this interview, especially with a guy like Brett who founded Aussie Ed. Education tip number two. Aim for continuous improvement. I mean, what a great quote he mentioned with one of the educators he's run into. Have you been teaching for 20 years or have you just taught for one year over a 20-year period? Continuous improvement is often thrown out there as a thing. I mean, it almost feels cliched, but it's real. This lifelong learning thing is very much important. None of us are perfect and we can always do better. So definitely try and kick goals as far as you can. And third tip, You just don't know what you don't know. (laughs) And for some of us, especially me, that could be a lot. There is so much out there. And if you can find more avenues where you can find out more things, I mean, go to conferences. He mentioned iPad Palooza. Go to local teach meets at your school or even, uh, I know there are science in the pub and things where you can find out new information and new techniques. There's so much you can learn. And also, look, if you know stuff, teach others. I mean, Brett's come up with this brilliant idea with Rob about World STEM with sharing these one or two minute videos on teaching in a classroom. This is valuable. So look, if you've got knowledge that to share, go for it. Don't just sit on it. That way it can be not just your student's benefit, but potentially much, much further. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. 
Love your science? We do too. Here's this episode's education tip of the week. Grab your pencil and get ready to make some notes. And yet again, it's another time for a tip of the week. And in this case, I'd like you to think about using songs to teach science. Look, there's so many songs out there. I mean, some of us could certainly know about the Big Bang Theory song. And in some cases, it's not a bad way to start about learning about how the whole universe started. But look, all seriousness... Creating songs in a classroom can be a good thing. It doesn't just have to be about checking out a YouTube video. I mean, certainly there are YouTube videos out there like check out the band They Might Be Giants. They've got a number of uh, songs like Meet the Elements and I'm a Paleontologist. These teach kids you know, science, but what about getting kids to do it themselves? So why don't you get kids to consider choosing a tune that they enjoy? They could pick a topic in science that they want to create, or you could give them the topic, of course. They should do some research around that topic and then get them to write lyrics about the information they've gathered. This is going to be a bit fun because unlike just sending them home a pen and paper project or something they can do research online, now the kids can get creative with this knowledge that they're finding. Now, here's the thing. you got to get them to record it and get it played. And I know that some people might get a little bit squeamish, especially if you haven't got a bunch of extroverts. I mean, that's a good thing in some ways. But for group work, this could work quite well where some kids could be in charge of you know getting the lyrics together. Others could be in charge of putting together the recording. Others could be the performers. Others could be the ones who actually edit it up and help you get onto YouTube in a private channel or something. This could be a fun project for students to do. So there you go. Why not try this out? I mean, maybe this could be for bonus points in an upcoming assessment or seriously, just something that's just a little bit fun. This is the Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Grab a copy of our new book, Be Amazing, How to Teach Science the Way Primary Kids Love, from our website. Just search Be Amazing Book. It's available in hard copy and ebook. Go to physicseducation.com.au. That's physics spelled F I Z I C S. So, after listening to Brett's interview, you might be thinking, oh my gosh, that's such a huge thing to have so many teachers involved in a Twitter chat like this and now working on to World STEM. But here's the thing it's often worth starting any idea in a very small area and slowly growing it over time. And from our last interview with Joanne and Emma from the National Indigenous Science Education Program, they hail out of Macquarie University, by the way, they definitely know about this because, uh, well, take Take a listen to Joanne's thoughts on this. So start off being central to the school and community, do the activities there, get those to work well before you start making it too big. Yeah. Um, if you're not careful, this type of program can become quite overwhelming. Yeah. And we want to ensure, particularly when we're working with groups that, well, we, we don't want to promise within any of the organisations more than what we can deliver. Yep. That actually can potentially cause harm rather than good. So ensure it's well planned for the initial stages to work well and then slowly build from that. Build a strong network. Recognise that the school community, the teachers, science teachers for example, and the support staff within the school as well as wider community members, such as Aboriginal elders, are important to that, as well as academic staff. And within universities, recognise you have an amazing potential with your own university students. Yeah, couldn't agree more, Joanne. That is brilliant knowing that university students have a lot to offer and so do community elders and other people who are engaged with schools to really, really affect education in a great way. And look, you can listen to that whole episode on the Physics Ed podcast. Just jump onto iTunes, look for episode six of the podcast and Joanne and Emma can tell you all about the National Indigenous Science Education Program. Thanks for listening to the Physics Ed podcast. Sign up now for our fortnightly email newsletter. It's loaded with details on new experiments you can do, STEM teaching articles, new gadgets, exclusive offers and upcoming events. Go to physicseducation.com.au. Scroll to the bottom and add your email. So that yet again brings us to the end of another Physics Ed podcast. I hope you've enjoyed this. A bit of a long one this time, but I know there was a lot of value to be had. Definitely jump on our website. There's a lot of free stuff that you can definitely use from local shops to teach science in very different ways. Please 
leave a review, leave a comment on iTunes. We certainly read it and it certainly helps us craft something which is useful to educators all over the place. Hey, next week, check out uh, the interview we're doing with Karen Player from the Australian Museum. She started the Australian Museum, well, quite a few years ago as a volunteer and has worked in many different ways within the Australian Museum, front of house, back of house, and lately has been coordinating the Museum in the Box program to get science supplies out to schools all over the country, as well as coordinating the video conferencing learning events. A lot to be had there. I hope you enjoy that. And as always, may your science lessons be fun. Please, please, please make them informative and grab your students' imagination whenever you can. My name's Ben Newsom from Physics Education, and you've been listening to the Physics Ed Podcast. You've been listening to another Physics Ed Podcast. We're excited about science. Subscribe to us on iTunes to download the next episode as soon as it's released. And don't forget, for hundreds of ideas, free experiments, our new Be Amazing book and more, go to physicseducation.com.au.